first name's not the. His first name's Holy. And I want to talk to you about my best friend. His name is Holy Spirit. And I believe that God is wanting to give a revelation of the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ in this hour. Not as a force field or a fuzzy or some kind of force that you touch that makes you feel funny and knocks you down. But he's a person. He is a person. He is God. He has a personality. He has a will. He has a mind. He has an agenda. And that's the complete consuming of your life and bringing all your thoughts, all your emotions, all your desires, and bringing your whole life under the leadership of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit is God. Amen? Amen. We know that doctrinally, but do you know it? Everybody put your hand on your belly. I want to introduce you to someone this morning. Everyone say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. You just sat there so calm saying that. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm talking about the God who spoke the heavens into being. We talked about that last night. The God who showed up on Mount Sinai and shook the whole mountain. And if anyone touched the mountain, they died. The God who split the Red Sea in two. The God who has Genesis 1 on his resume. That God, Job 26, says that these are the mere edges of his ways. Which means you haven't seen nothing yet. And that God now resides in you by the Holy Spirit. And you need to thank God right now that there's not smoke coming out of your ears. I'm serious. You need to thank God that you did not blow up in your sleep last night. You need to thank God that God has, because every time God shows up in temples, they start shaking. Every time God shows up, everything starts quaking. Do you know, it says in Revelation 21, that when He appears, the Father appears, heaven and earth will flee away before His very face. And we have the eternal God dwelling in us, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 2 Corinthians 6.16 says that you and I are the temple of the living God. And that God has actually created a structure that doesn't explode at His presence. But we can actually contain His presence. And I believe we need a revelation of that dwelling Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, here's the verse for you. We know it, but we don't know it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, who in here is in Christ? Yes. Uh, three of you, praise God. We're going to have a big altar call today. He is a new creation. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The moment I believe, without a doubt, that greater than any blind eye popping open, deaf ear popping open, dead being raised, the greatest miracle that has or ever will take place is the miracle that takes place when you and I, by the Holy Spirit, give our lives to Jesus Christ. And in that moment, we who were once dead become alive. And our spirits, which were once dead, now becomes the home. Of the very seed of the living God. And that we become a new creation. Yeah. My goodness. We receive a new nature. Huh? We receive new desires. We receive a new relationship with God. We receive a new destiny. We receive new power over sin. Remember how you used to be before you came to Christ? You sinned for a living. And you had nothing within you that said stop it. You loved it. You enjoyed it. And it's because what you did as a job. But now by the Holy Spirit, we have received the power to say no to the works of the flesh and to say yes to God. That's power. I believe it's the greatest miracle. John 14. I don't have time to go into all of this today. I'm just going to Mostly just pointing you to something to begin to feed on. Because I'm after more than you walking away saying it was a good message. 
We have got to get equipped. If this doesn't bleed into Tuesday morning doing dishes, then it doesn't mean much. If this doesn't bleed, you need to do your dishes, man. <laughs> if this doesn't bleed into driving kids to school, if this doesn't bleed into our work week, our mornings, our afternoons, and our nights, then we're just having a good time today that we'll forget about come Super Bowl tonight. I want to see something shift your very Christian experience. Amen. And it begins by us going back and reconnecting to what happened yeah. the moment we were born of the Spirit. Yeah. First John says that the seed of God dwells within us. The DNA of God dwells within us. My goodness. He says in First John that he who is born of God cannot sin or does not sin. What does that mean? He says this. I want to tell you, you want to know a clear sign if someone's been born of the Spirit. They will never be a successful sinner. Are y'all with me this morning? I don't know about you, but I tried to do some things after I got saved that I did before I got saved. And when I did it after I got saved, I thought I was going to fall into hell. As I began to realize there's someone within me that's screaming from within I don't like that. Stop that. You're not your own anymore. You were bought at a price. And I live within you and begin to connect in that moment. There's someone in there. There's someone in there. <laughs> God dwells within me. And I want to tell you, this is the most glorious revelation that will change your Christian life. Is when you connect. You don't have to go way up there to find him or go down in the depths. But he has made you his home. And you come to rest in here. Living from the inside out. The night before Jesus was crucified. He sat there with these 11 disciples. He's about, he says guys I'm about to leave you. You're going to be hated by the Jews. Hated by the Romans. Hated by everybody. And I'm not going to put AK-47s in your hand. I'm introducing you to a person. The person is me, but he's not because he's the father. But he's not the father because he's, an, he's his own self because he's me. But he's not me because he's the father. Which is he? Yes. <laughs> Jesus says, I am going to send you help. Everybody say, I need a helper. Yeah. You, are you in touch with how much help you need? Oh, yeah. I want to tell you something right now. The Christian life is not about you pulling up your bootstraps and about behavior modification and you being your best neighbor now. It is about creatures who are completely unable to do anything. Because you're not that smart. We're not that strong. We don't have that much gifting. There's only one thing going for us. God lives in us. God has placed the deposit. Now looks to us to get delivered from our pride. And look to him. So that we can begin to draw on the account of what he's given us. I love it. John 14. I want to just run through some verses. It's all read from John 13 through 17. It's all read in your Bibles. Which means Jesus has something to say. He's preparing us. And I want to tell you, you want to get revelation of this. Verse, and I'm just going to rub through some verses. Here we go, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. Everybody say forever. forever. I want you to know, Holy Spirit isn't a band-aid until Jesus comes back. You will forever be relating with Jesus in the next billion years by the Holy Spirit. He's your eternal roommate. He says this, he says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Look at this. But you know him for he will dwell with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Hallelujah. Look, I love, just leave that up there. Isn't that awesome? I will not leave you orphans. He goes, guys, I've got to go. But I'm not going to leave you in this place of having no protection or having no involvement or intimacy with me. I'm going to come to you, but I'm coming to you in a different way. I want you to get that. 
He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. I love this. But you will see me by the Spirit. Because I live, you will live also. And then he says, at that day, you're going to know three things. I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave, not as the world gives. Then Jesus slips into John 15 and he gives us the picture of the Christian life. And he says, this is the picture of the Christian life. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the source and you're connected to me and you're in me. Who in here is giving your life to Jesus? Amen. All right, good. Well, the Bible says that he's the vine and you're the branches. Jesus says, praise God, you're in me, but there's one command. That you've got to connect with. And that if you don't get this command, you're not going to be useful in the kingdom. It's this command in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Get a hold of this. For without me, you can do nothing. Now that makes for a nice verse. I know that God, I need you all the time. But in the same way, the branch is sucked into the vine, pulling the sap of the vine into the branches. Jesus says, you're in me, but there is still a part you must play. Mm, come on. There is still a choice that you must make every moment of every day, of every second, and that's called abiding. That's called drawing on the sap of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Learning how to draw on the sap, and it's called obedience. He says, abide in my love. How do you abide in your love? Whatever I tell you, do it. And when you live in the boundaries of what I'm saying and obey me, you will find the flow of intimacy taking place. Abide in my love. Abide. Draw on the sap. I want you to know something right now. God has placed riches on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Look with me in John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Everybody say advantage. Amen. I love that word. He it says it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, that helper, I love that will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he's come, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus is telling them, saying, guys, quit breaking my heart. You guys are getting all sorry about this. You're about to get an upgrade in your relationship with God. I want to say something to you right now. You and I have more access to heaven right now than if we'd have been a disciple when Jesus was on the earth. You have more access to the resources of heaven right now than if you'd have been a disciple with Jesus on the earth. Jesus was actually a ceiling. Jesus on the earth was actually a ceiling to their experience. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. It is going to get better for you. You are going to have more access and the relationship I have with Abba, I'm now bringing you up into by the Holy Spirit. And the riches that I live in, I'm now inviting you into this fellowship of the Godhead with us. My goodness. You got that though, don't you? We got that? Let's get it, man. He says this. He says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I want to tell you, you start getting intimate with the Holy Spirit, you will get up in your business. <laughs> Look at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Which means you can't handle the truth. You can't handle what i got to say to you. You don't have the hard drive to be able to handle what I want to give you. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, I see six manifestations of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this next verse right here. Verse 13 and 14 gives us six ministry of the Holy Spirit. First one is this. He will guide you into all truth. Number two, he will not speak on his own authority. Number three, whatever he hears, he will speak to you. Number four, 
He will tell you things to come. Who wants to get prophetic? Get near the prophet. He will glorify me, number five. Number six, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Whatever he hears, he will tell you. So our new question is this, Holy Spirit, what are you hearing? When I come into Lakeland on Friday night, this is my prayer time. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to Lakeland? That's where all of my beginning begins. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What are you feeling? What's on your heart? And what are you doing? And I begin to talk to him. Holy Spirit. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9. I has not seen nor ear heard, he's quoting Isaiah 64, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I want you to know something in this room, that God has a billion, a billion, a billion years of search and discovery for you. And there are things that haven't even entered into your mind yet. And you will be freshly wowed forever in eternity. Amen. And you will never get used to him and he will be forever wowing you. Come on, he will be forever tailor-made wowing each one of us in the unique design that he has made us. Amen. And you will never get used to him. But I want you to know this. Look at verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. God has taken the stuff of eternity and he has placed it within us right now. You have eternity dwelling within you. Who in here has bought a house recently? Huh? Good. What is the clearest way you say, I'm going to buy the house? Your down payment. And when you put the down payment down, you go, I'm all in. And this is my earnest, my guarantee that I'm going to buy the whole house. Love of the Bible is called 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 8. He's called the down payment. Hallelujah. He is called the guarantee yes. because God isn't just happy with just a born again spirit. He says, I'll be back in a second. I'm going to get the whole house. Come on. Glory. <sighs> you want to know why I know Jesus is coming back? Because Jesus doesn't make deposits that he's not going to come and get the fullness on. Amen. The very witness of the spirit of God within you is the witness that he's coming back to finish the whole deal. That's why I know Jesus Christ is coming back in bodily form. Because he started something and he's going to finish it. This was the day. And I'm telling you, all of Europe's coming underneath the, the leadership. You know what I'm saying. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. And then we begin to see operations of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. How about the deep things? Yes, Corey, the deep things of God. It's like he's answering a question. We didn't know we were asking. <laughs> Who in here loves Google? Three of them. I use it all the time. I use Google, Google ten times a day for names or whatever I need. You can type in a name or a phrase. And you can get hundreds and thousands of websites connected to that name. And that's a human search engine. Holy Spirit is the search engine of heaven. Holy Spirit is the search engine of heaven. What does Holy Spirit know of the Father? Of the Son? What does Holy Spirit know about God our Shepherd? God our Savior? God our King? God our Judge? What does Holy Spirit know? He is the search engine of heaven. Hallelujah. We'll keep going. I, I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. Because it's not about how smart you are. It's about how humble you are. It's not about how smart you are. You have the smartest person ever living within you. The gifts, the fruit, and the wisdom. And all he's looking for you to do is to refuse to live Christianity out of your own strength. That's all he is asking you to do is to look to him and to abide in him, which means live with a limp. 
live with the sense of dependency. Because can I tell you something? I sense a lot of pride here. I sense a lot of our own working and living in your own ingenuity, your own wisdom, your own abilities. The own, the own, the own. And God said, I want you to look to me. I want you to live a life of dependence on me. Because we have been given glorious. It says in 2 Peter 1, everything that pertains to life and godliness, he has revealed to us through the knowledge of God. He says this, but God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. Keep going in the next verse. He says this, for what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Not you on your best day. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why have you and I received the Spirit of God? So we can walk around saying, hallelujah, I got the Spirit, you got the Spirit? No, so that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now, this brings me to my point. I just talked for 20 minutes to say my next phrase. <laughs> but you got to talk about it for the 20 minutes so you guys can say, what world is he talking about? I'll tell you this. Here's the issue. You've been given a billion dollars in your belly. There is a billion dollars in your belly. Why do you say belly? Because Jesus says out of the belly will flow rivers of living water. John 7, 37. You've been given a billion dollars in your belly. Here is the problem with the majority of us in this room. We're living on 20 cents a day. We are living on food stamps in the kingdom. We are living as paupers below the poverty line. And the whole while, and I want to tell you something, Jesus is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. Which means he's a wise investor. He's a wise businessman. And he doesn't make billion dollar deposit for 20 cent returns. He, I'm telling you, he's shrewd. Jesus is shrewd. He's a businessman. He's wise. And he has placed a lot in you. And he is looking for returns. Hallelujah. So the question now stands, how do we get the money? How do we get the money? If you've been given a billion dollars in your spiritual bank account, this happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus died and was resurrected. And he placed his very own spirit within you. Think about how much God loves you. Think about how close God wants to be with you. He came, God came to the earth and took on our frame. He didn't become an angel when angels fell. Do you understand that Satan and one third of the angels tried to usurp God's throne? God throws them down and doesn't pay attention to them. 100% of us stick the thumb up at God and God says, not so fast. And he comes and he takes on our form. He puts us on and he becomes a man forever. A man forever. He doesn't like take off the man suit. He'll forever be a man. But he doesn't even stop there. He dies our death, goes into the grave, comes out of the grave, ascends to the right hand of the Father, receives the Holy Spirit, and he pours out Holy Spirit so he can now come live from within. Come on. Look, he is closer than your sin. He's closer than your skin, and he is living within us. Jesus Christ. This was the mystery in Colossians 1.27. Paul says the unsearchable riches of the mystery preached among the Gentiles. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you. The hope of glory. That is the most mind-boggling revelation. Is the spirit of Jesus Christ is living within me. Now, we just take that for granted. Just think first on how weird that is. Think if I said, I'm going to die tomorrow, but my spirit's going to come live in me. <laughs> what is the spirit of a man? It's the real man. It is the essence, the substance, the nature of the man. We are spirits who have souls and we live in bodies. 
lot of this doesn't even make sense because most of us live from the outside in. We live completely exterior. Most of us are so connected with what we see, taste, touch, and hear. And the interior life looks like an overgrown garden eaten up by weeds, bugs, and our garden is getting destroyed. It's time for the church in Florida to begin to build their interior lives. You understand what I'm talking about? You have been born again and God wants us to cultivate and partner. So how do we access the money? Prayer. How do we access the money? How do you pray? What does prayer look like? What does it mean to pray? I, I'm just re-asking everything. Because again, if this doesn't bleed with screaming kids in the back of the van, you're driving them to school. How can we begin to access riches in the middle of life? How can we begin to access riches in the middle where you're in the middle of a business deal and you need a breakthrough of wisdom from God and you need wisdom now in the moment? One is, it's not going to just show up. You cultivate a life of living in that and then you just begin to move and you know it. How do you do it? I want to give you three ways this morning of how to access the riches of His glory. Because I want to say something to you right now. God has a part and we have a part. God won't do our part and we can't do His. Amen. And I want to say something to everybody in here. God doesn't dance with mannequins. God doesn't dance with mannequins. What do you mean, Corey? He danced with partners. And God will not violate your free will choices that you make with your time, with your words. He will not violate it. And you will have less in God because you choose so. That's the most terrifying thing is you and I dictate the life of God we want. And he says, you lead the dance. You lead the dance. That's terrifying. Because God will not violate the free will. I want more than a get out of jail free card and going to heaven. If just not going to hell is Christian life, you understand know not going to hell is about 10th on my list. No, going to hell is about 10th on my list. Experiencing eternal life, imbibing deeply on the pleasures and the joys of being loved and loving God. That's what we were made for. I was made to drink from waters that this world cannot touch. I was made to experience peace that nothing of this world can give me. And not just a once in a while reality, but an imbibing deeply. What does that mean, imbibing? Drinking. 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 How do you drink? We've got to learn how to receive. First one's this. Meditation in the Word of God. Everybody say, slow down. You know, I'm going to take the yoke off of you. I know it's New Year's and we've all got our Bible reading plans. Just chunk your Bible reading plans. I mean, I think it's good. Read the Bible. You're set before it. It's good every day. But most of us do it like we do everything else in our life. Performance-driven little kids who can check it off our list. And we do it and we're completely disconnected that this is God starting a conversation with us. Right. And that these words, who in here has experienced words jumping off the page when you read the Bible? That's God saying, now put the Bible down, let's talk. I want to talk to you and I want you to ask me questions. I want you to engage with me because there is a man on the other side of this book. There's a man on the other side of this book talking to you today. And he's requiring for you to begin to slow down. And he says, I want you to know, I think about the old Beach Boys song, you get there faster if you take it slow. I'm sure I think of that. You get there faster if you take it slow. Slowing down, receiving and drinking of the word of God and letting his words wash you, letting his words cleanse you, and then beginning to speak the word of God back to you. Here's the verse, John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Here's my question. Does his word live in you? Does his word live in you? He says this. Look at this promise. 
If you abide me and my words abide you, this is what happens. You got a blank check. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. When God's words live in you, his thoughts, plans, and desires begin to fill you. And the things he wants are now the things you want. And when you ask him to do it, he says, sure, it started with me anyway. I want to tell you something. Right? This is where the Christian life begins, sustains, and ends by. Learning to receive from God. That's the first one right there is meditation in the Word. I don't have time to go into it today. Number two, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, the last verse of 2 Corinthians. It's an amazing verse. He says, now may the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship or the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what I love to do. I love to picture Holy Spirit living within me. What are some of the different characteristics or pictures of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God? Fire. Living water. Water. Wind. Oil. Wind. Light. 2 Corinthians 3 says we beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. <laughs> glory. She kind of glory lives within us. This is what I love to do is to take time. I do this about five to ten times a day for about three to five minutes. I want you to get a vision for three to five minute windows to turn within. And I will picture fire. Do you know you're a burning bush? Do you know river of water are rushing within you right now? I'm not being, this is not Eastern mysticism or some weirdness. Amen. You're like, what are you talking about, brother? Jesus lives in my heart right here. <laughs> and I can't wait to go so I can go live with Jesus forever. There's so much just religious thinking. It's small thinking is all it is. There's so much small thinking. I'm here to tell you right now, you don't have to grit your teeth and do life here. God has placed within us glory. Hallelujah. Fire. Pick one. I do it with my kids. Fire. Light. River. Wind. Picture one. And I'll fill my mind's eye with the indwelling Holy Spirit, what He looks like. And I'll begin to do this several times a day. And I, you can write down the acronym TRUST down on your piece of paper. Some of you got good memories. So just, I'm saying it to you. T. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I will begin to take time to honor the indwelling Holy Spirit in my life. Thank you that you live within me. You made your enemy your home. Or reign in me, Holy Spirit. Here's the key that unlocks the door to the treasure house of heaven. Ask. Here it is. Reign in me, Holy Spirit. Reign over my thought life. Reign over my emotions. Who in here gets emotional really quickly and just throws your day for a loop? Three of you. The rest of you are walking full on in the spirit. I'm an emotional guy. Something can go bad at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'll swirl. I'll swirl till 9.30. And go, what in the world did I do today? I don't want to be led by my emotions. I don't want to be led by my thoughts. I don't want to be led by my desires or my circumstances. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8 says, these are the sons of God, those who are led. So I'll say, reign in me, Holy Spirit, reign over my thought life today. And then I'll move to the you. Use me, Holy Spirit. Use my hands. Use my mouth. Let me look at the cashier lady and she feel love. Let me look at the bank teller and let her feel love today. Let a word come out of my mouth that strengthens weary bones. Use my hands to heal the sick. Stir up all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Use me today, God. S. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit.
Strengthen me, Holy Spirit. You understand you have a power and light district dwelling within you? You do. Be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. T. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Teach me, Holy Spirit. First John says there's an anointing that abides within you that teaches you all things. You have an anointing. Everybody say, I have an anointing. I have an anointing. That's number two. Here's number three. Praying in tongues has changed my life. Praying in tongues has changed my life. And the things that the charismatic church is most known for is the thing we do the least of. We've relegated it to falling down at an altar. We relegated it to some sign that you're there or you're in the club, which then becomes a new religious spirit. Amen. And I want to tell you something right now. The Apostle Paul showed up the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. That's crazy. It's the greatest picture into the devotional life of the Apostle Paul in the Word of God. I want to here has your prayer language. Raise your hand. If you have your prayer language, you've been filled with the Spirit. Good, there's a great group. You had this. Today's your day. <laughs> Hear me. Praying in tongues has changed my life. Yes. Jesus is called the one who's going to baptize you with Holy Spirit to fire. Yes. The book of Acts is filled with account after account of when Holy Spirit falls, they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. Hallelujah. And Jesus is the great Baptist. He's the baptizer. I want to tell you something. That there is more than what you're currently knowing in your relationship with God. There is more. There is more intimacy. There's more power. There's more glory. Some of you can't get breakthrough from those sins. And it's because you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues. If you want to see the spirit of revelation open up over your life. begin to, and This is my call to everyone today. If you have received your prayer language and you have it, I'm inviting every one of you for 20 to 25 minutes a day of uninterrupted praying in the Spirit until you see Jesus. Amen. 25 minutes a day of uninterrupted praying in the Holy Spirit until you see Jesus. Why 25 minutes? Because something starts happening. And it's not my fault if you go to the 35. <laughs> The Bible says that when we speak in tongues, we speak mysteries in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mysteries. Who wants to see the Spirit of Revelation increase in your life? Who wants to see this thing go from a whisper to a roar? Who, I want to tell you, when you start praying in the Holy Spirit, it's like the old kettle popcorn. You're putting the fire underneath that, those pop, 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 pop. And pray. I'm going to tell you, the Word of God and the Spirit, phrases, verses, prayers are breaking out of me when I start praying in the Holy Spirit. You want to see the still small voice. You want to see your knower get sharper. You want to see your knower. I want to tell you, most Christians spend their life in the room of what's God's will. What's God's will? 80% of what's God's will will be solved when you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. I have to go on a three-day retreat to find out. I know what the mind and the will of God is for this situation. <laughs> Holy Spirit. The mind of the Spirit. The Spirit of Revelation. You'll begin to see words of prophecy and words of knowledge begin to increase in your life. Secrets. You'll begin to know things about people you never knew before. Amen. Phrases, things. You'll begin to have images that you never saw before. You'll begin to see them when you get around them. You'll begin to feel things you never felt. You'll feel people's pain at a greater level and then come with power because you step right into the moment. That's mysteries breaking. You create an atmosphere of revelation. People feel safe in your presence. They share in your presence. Secrets get revealed in your presence. The Bible says that when we speak in tongues that we edify ourselves. You don't need my hands laid on you. You got a lot more anointed hand on the inside of you. 
There's a lot more anointed hand on the inside of you. He is the anointed. And we charge. When I pray in the Holy Spirit for 25 minutes, I charge my spiritual battery. And it makes me strong in God. It fortifies my emotional life. It fortifies my thought life. It fortifies me. It strengthens me. It gives me fresh legs to stand for another day and to take my stand. Guys, we just went through hell this last year with the loss of our son. There's one thing I've been doing. Praying in the Holy Spirit. There's one thing. I don't understand anything, but I am going to stay connected to my North Star. And we're going to get through this. And you're going to empower me by the Spirit. It's not a nice little teaching. This is a life or death situation for me. It is part of your spiritual armor. Many Christians don't know how to fight. We live oppressed and we think this is all there is. I want to tell you there's something on the other side of your oppression. And it may not be the meeting that's going to set you free. It could be 25 minutes of you beginning to shake yourself from the dust. And beginning to pray in the Holy Spirit in your house. Beginning to create a new environment in your home. Whenever I begin to get provoked, we just swirl it in the house. Everybody sit out. 25 minutes. <laughs> I get angry. That's how I got into praying in the Spirit. I kept getting attacked by the devil. I got mad. I said, I'm going to pray until I feel peace. <laughs> and I'm not stopping. Sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes two hours. But I ain't going anywhere. We're going to have peace in this house. <laughs> It's part of your spiritual armor. You have two weapons. You need to know them. The Word of God, sword of the Spirit, and praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Ephesians 6. And I want to tell you this. Here's another one. Whoever you hang out with is who you start acting like. You want to get holy? Hang out with holy. He's the great changer and sanctifier of your character, your thought life. Never see, I want to tell you something right now. I want to see a new breed of charismatic believers in Lakeland that actually embody the Word of the Spirit, deeply rooted in character, and there's no dichotomy in the lives they built filled with the Holy Spirit. I love reading the book of Acts. I've just been reading it afresh. And how does God define men from the Word of God? And He was full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if the Bible would say that about a person's life, and He was full of the Holy Spirit. That's what I want about my life. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.